Hi and welcome back to my channel. In today's video, we will talk after botched execution by electric chair. In the electrifying history of capital punishment, electrocution emerged in the late 19th century, hailed as a shocking alternative to hanging. Thomas Edison, yes, the light bulb genius himself, became an ardent advocate of execution by electrocution. Fast forward to the 20th century, where electrocution became the go-to method for dispatching death row inmates, clocking in over a thousand executions by 1972. Then, a brief break, a moratorium on capital punishment. But in 1977, the voltage returned, sending over 160 souls into the abyss since. Electrocution has, in recent times, faced a shocking identity crisis. Strapping a condemned person into a wooden chair, attaching electrodes to their legs and noggin, and unleashing volts through their body was supposed to be efficient. One jolt, lights out. The second, vital organs sizzled. Sounds neat, but in practice it's been a hair-raising mess. The one that stands out is Frank J. Coppola's 1982 ordeal in Virginia. A gruesome spectacle. An execution gone horribly wrong. It took two long jolts of electricity to kill Coppola. The first did not stop his heart. During the second 55 second long jolt, one could hear the sound of sizzling flesh, and Coppola's head and leg both caught fire. Smoke filled the small death chamber, making it difficult to see the writhing victim through the haze. Even when the electrocution goes right, smoke rises from the body of the convict, and the small execution chamber reeks of charred flesh, which is why prison officers habitually soak their clothes overnight before washing them to get rid of the smell after an execution. The execution of Evans took a nightmarish turn. As the initial surge of electricity coursed through his body, sparks and flames erupted from the electrode attached to Evans's leg. The electrode burst from the strap holding it in place and caught on fire. But the horror did not end there. Smoke and sparks, akin to malevolent spirits, danced ominously beneath the hood near Evans's left temple. Two physicians ventured into the chamber to confront the unimaginable. To their astonishment, a faint heartbeat persisted amidst the chaos. The electrode was reattached to Evans's leg, and a second surge of electricity surged forth, accompanied by more grotesque smoke and the sickening scent of burning flesh. Inexplicably, the heartbeat endured, as if death itself recoiled from its intended victim. In defiance of pleas from Evans's desperate lawyer, a third and final jolt of electricity was mercilessly delivered. The entire horrifying ordeal unfolded over an excruciating 14-minute span, leaving Evans's once human form reduced to a charred, smoldering husk. A truly shocking event, the initial electric charge meant to end a life proved horrifyingly ineffective. The condemned individual, Stevens, endured a torturous eight-minute battle for breath, following the initial two-minute surge of power. It was a grave spectacle of survival against all odds. Following this futile attempt, there came a chilling six-minute pause, allowing Stephen's body to cool. It was during this seemingly interminable interlude that 23 breaths escaped his quivering form, each one a defiant act against the inexorable grip of death. A prison official from Georgia said, Stevens was just not a conductor of electricity, revealing how the intended instrument of death had somehow spared Stevens, leaving him to wrestle with mortality for those agonizing moments. After the first administration of 2,300 volts, Vandiver was still breathing. The execution eventually took 17 minutes and 5 jolts of electricity. Vandiver's attorney, Herbert Shapps, witnessed the execution and observed smoke and the smell of burning. He called the execution outrageous. The Department of Corrections admitted the execution did not go according to plan. Another deeply disturbing sequence of events, an execution became a grisly testament to human error. It took two excruciating jolts of electricity, spaced nine minutes apart, to finally complete the execution. The first surge, meant to end the prisoner's life, tragically failed, revealing a twist. In a surreal moment, the captain of the prison guard, in an admission of grave error, opened the door to the witness room and confessed, I believe we've got the jacks on wrong. 
the cables responsible for delivering the deadly current had been improperly connected, rendering the initial attempt futile. After the cables were painstakingly reconnected, a second jolt was administered. Death was officially declared a staggering 19 minutes after the initial electric charge. During the execution of Tefero, six-inch flames erupted from his head, and three jolts of power were required to stop his breathing. State officials claimed that the botched execution was caused by inadvertent human error, the inappropriate substitution of a synthetic sponge for a natural sponge that had been used in previous executions. They attempted to support this theory by sticking a part of a synthetic sponge into a common household toaster and observing that it smoldered and caught fire. Tafero's death led to a new debate on humane methods of execution. Several states ceased use of the electric chair and adopted lethal injection as their means of capital punishment. To add to the woes, Tefero was most likely innocent and executed for murders he did not commit. When Evans was hit with the first burst of electricity, blood spewed from the right side of the mask on Evans's face, drenching Evans's shirt with blood and causing a sizzling sound as blood dripped from his lips. Evans continued to moan before a second jolt of electricity was applied. The autopsy concluded that Evans suffered a bloody nose after the voltage surge elevated his high blood pressure. Peterson died in the electric chair, but not before officials at the Greensville Correction Center had to repeat the electrocution procedure. A doctor at the prison checked Mr. Peterson's pulse and determined that he was still alive after being given the normal amount of electricity used to execute people. 1,725 volts for 10 seconds and 240 volts for about 90 seconds. Seven and one half minutes after the first attempt to kill the inmate, the entire process was then repeated, after which Peterson was pronounced dead. Prison officials later announced that in the future, they would routinely administer two cycles before checking for a heartbeat. A crown of foot-high flames shot from the headpiece during the execution of Medina, filling the execution chamber with a stench of thick smoke and gagging the two dozen official witnesses. An official then threw a switch to manually cut off the power and prematurely end the two-minute cycle of 2,000 volts. Medina's chest continued to heave until the flames stopped and death came. After the execution, prison officials blamed the fire on a corroded copper screen in the headpiece of the electric chair. But two experts hired by the governor later concluded that the fire was caused by the improper application of a sponge designed to conduct electricity to Medina's head. The governor, Mr. Gov Lawton Childs, said he was told by the attending doctor that the burns were no different than you'd see at any execution, and in his opinion, he felt no pain. Attorney General Bob Butterworth said the inmate's death would be a deterrent to crime. According to Gene Morris, a spokesman for the Florida Department of Corrections, it was something entirely out of the ordinary. I have witnessed 11 executions and have never seen anything like what we saw this morning. Before he was pronounced dead, the blood from Alan Lee Davis's mouth had poured onto the collar of his white shirt, and the blood on his chest had spread to about the size of a dinner plate, even oozing through the buckle holes on the leather chest strap holding him to the chair. His execution was the first in Florida's new electric chair, built especially so it could accommodate a man Davis's size, approximately 350 pounds. Later, when another Florida death row inmate challenged the constitutionality of the electric chair, Florida Supreme Court Justice Leander Shaw commented that the color photos of Davis depict a man who, for all appearances, was brutally tortured to death by the citizens of Florida. Justice Shaw also described the botched executions of Jesse Tafiro and Pedro Medina, calling the three executions barbaric spectacles and acts more befitting a violent murderer than a civilized state. The execution was witnessed by a Florida state senator, Ginny Brown Waite, who at first was shocked to see the blood until she realized that the blood was forming the shape of a cross and that it was a message from God saying he supported the execution. In the late 19th century, New York developed the electric chair as an alternative to hanging for executions, leading to the execution of William Kemmler in 1890. Several other states adopted this method, but today, 
No state solely relies on electrocution for executions. Nebraska used the electric chair until it was deemed unconstitutional in 2008. The process involves strapping the person to a chair, attaching electrodes to the head and leg, and administering a jolt of 500 to 2,000 volts for about 30 seconds, repeating until the person is confirmed dead. This process can result in violent movement, dislocation, fractures, tissue swelling, defecation, and burning smells. U.S. Supreme Court Justice William Brennan once offered the following description of an execution by electric chair. The prisoner's eyeballs sometimes pop out and rest on his cheeks. The prisoner often defecates, urinates, and vomits blood and drool. The body turns bright red as its temperature rises, and the prisoner's flesh swells and his skin stretches to the point of breaking. Sometimes the prisoner catches fire. Witnesses hear a loud and sustained sound like bacon frying, and the sickly sweet smell of burning flesh permeates the chamber. After death, the body's temperature remains high enough to cause blistering upon touch, necessitating a delay in the autopsy until the internal organs cool. Third-degree burns and blackening are observed at the points where the electrodes made contact with the skin on the scalp and legs. According to Robert H. Kirshner, the deputy chief medical examiner of Cook County, the brain appears cooked in most cases.